plasma and how it can be controlled by magnetic force fields when it's very hot at temperatures of 100 million degrees. This is a plasma. It may not look very impressive. It appears to be just a tenuous, luminous gas. But watch the effect that a magnet has on it. No ordinary gas would behave in this way. This plasma is an example of a kind of matter that is quite distinct from the solids, liquids and gases of everyday experience. Plasma is a fourth state of matter. In large laboratories around the world, attempts are now being made to use magnetic fields to control very hot plasma. In this program, we will look at some of the principles involved in that work. But first, we must look more closely at the plasma state itself. Plasma is the stuff of stars. Although rarely encountered on the surface of the Earth, most astronomical bodies contain vast amounts of plasma. It's been estimated that more than 99% of the visible universe consists of plasma. On the Sun, enormous eruptions of plasma can be seen. Arch-shaped prominences, many times the size of the Earth, reveal the interplay of the plasma and the Sun's magnetic field. The Sun is immensely rich in plasma, but on Earth, there's almost none at all. On the Earth, ordinary matter is made of atoms. A typical atom consists of light, negatively charged electrons orbiting a heavy, positively charged nucleus. Under normal circumstances, atoms are electrically neutral. The negative charge carried by the orbiting electrons exactly balances the positive charge of the central nucleus. Within an ordinary gas, energy is stored in the kinetic energy of the individual atoms as they move around and collide with one another. Increasing the temperature of the gas corresponds to increasing the kinetic energy of a typical atom moving within the gas. As the temperature is increased, the atoms move more rapidly, and the collisions between atoms occur with increased energy. When an individual atom like this is involved in a collision in a very hot gas, the impact can be so violent that some of the outer orbiting electrons are stripped away. If a large number of the atoms in a gas have their electrons stripped away, the result is an electrically neutral mixture of colliding positive nuclei and negative electrons. The matter ceases to consist of atoms. Instead, it becomes a mixture of positive and negative charges that move almost independently apart from their collisions. It's this state of matter that is called a plasma. The center of the sun is mainly composed of plasma at a temperature of 20 million degrees. It is this central region that's the powerhouse of the sun. A process called nuclear fusion, taking place in the hot plasma at the sun's core, produces the energy that is eventually radiated away as sunlight. Fusion occurs when two rapidly moving nuclei collide and coalesce into a single nucleus. When two nuclei collide, they may fuse and liberate energy. Or well, then again, they may not. Most nuclear collisions do not result in fusion. They're just glancing blows in which the nuclei approach and then separate again, though there is the odd exception. The nuclei are all positively charged, so they naturally tend to repel each other. We can investigate the nuclear collisions that take place in a hot plasma more closely with the aid of this model. The repulsive Coulomb force between two positively charged nuclei is represented by this hill. It's this force that ensures that most nuclear collisions are just glancing blows. We can control the amount of kinetic energy involved in such collisions by means of this ramp. If the nucleus is released from somewhere close to the bottom of the ramp, the amount of kinetic energy involved in the collision 
is quite small. This would be typical of a collision in a fairly low temperature plasma. On the other hand, if the wall is released from somewhere closer to the top of the ramp, the amount of kinetic energy involved in the collision is correspondingly increased. And that's more like the kind of collision that takes place in a fairly high temperature plasma. From above, you can see that when the kinetic energy involved in the collision is quite small, the electrical repulsion easily prevents the two nuclei from getting close together. If the kinetic energy is increased somewhat, the nuclei get closer together before electrical repulsion forces them apart again. However, if the amount of kinetic energy involved in the collision is quite large, the nuclei may get sufficiently close together that they fuse into a single new nucleus. For fusion to take place, the two nuclei must get within 10 to the minus 15 meters of one another, because it's at this distance that a new, strongly attractive force comes into play. And it's this strongly attractive force that actually causes fusion. That strongly attractive force is called the strong nuclear force. It's not electrical and has nothing to do with the charges on the nuclei. But the strong nuclear force only operates over a very short range. So if two nuclei are to fuse, they must get sufficiently close together. And for that to happen, they must have sufficient kinetic energy. Only when this condition is satisfied can nuclei fuse and thus liberate energy. The sun derives its energy from thermonuclear fusion. The word thermo is used because it's the thermal motion of the nuclei in the hot plasma at the core of the sun that provides the necessary kinetic energy for nuclear fusion to take place. Here on Earth, it's hoped that the same process, thermonuclear fusion, can be controlled and used to provide a plentiful source of energy for the future. This is the heart of a capacitor bank at Cullum Laboratory, the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority's centre for research into controlled nuclear fusion and plasma physics. Each of these cylinders is a capacitor that can be charged to 40,000 volts. There are about a thousand of them stacked in this bank here, and altogether they can store about a million joules of energy. Now, in fact, that's not very much. If you work it out, there's less energy stored here than in the average car battery. But the important point is that the energy that's invested here over a comparatively long time can all be withdrawn in just a few milliseconds to provide a huge current down cables to a nearby laboratory. This is one of the machines that uses the current from the capacitor bank. The pulse of current flowing through these coils around the machine produces a magnetic field that's used to confine a plasma. A magnetic field is used because the temperature of the plasma is far too hot for it to be confined by any material container. And unlike the sun, the mass of plasma in here will always be far too small for gravitational forces to hold it together. Now, this machine will not produce thermonuclear fusion. The temperature of the plasma is far too low for that. But it will provide a great deal of information about the way that a plasma behaves in a magnetic field. In fact, the goal of the research here at Cullum is to find out how to produce a plasma in which fusion can occur. A plasma that is sufficiently dense, that has a temperature of 100 million degrees or more, and that's held together for at least a second. In this program, we'll be mainly concerned with how to hold the plasma together, the so-called confinement problem. And you'll see how machines like this use magnetic fields for this purpose. But first, why is it that magnetic fields play such an important role in attempts to confine a hot, dense plasma? The reason why magnetic fields have such strong influence on plasma lies in the nature of the plasma state itself. Remember, a plasma contains a great many colliding particles, positively and negatively charged. Unlike the charges in an ordinary gas, these are able to move independently of one another. When these independent charges move through a magnetic field, they're subject to the Lorentz force. 
For example, a single particle moving in a uniform magnetic field is forced to follow a helical trajectory. Using this model, which shows part of the trajectory of a positively charged particle as it moves through a uniform magnetic field, I can show you the direction of the Lorentz force. Remember, the Lorentz force is given by F equals Q V cross B. Q, the charge on the particle, is positive in this case. V, the velocity of the particle, changes as the particle moves along its helical trajectory. And B is the magnetic field. Using the right-hand rule for vector cross products, I can work out the direction of the Lorentz force at this point on the trajectory. Here, the velocity V is directed this way, towards you. And the magnetic field B is in this direction, towards the left. In order to work out the direction of the Lorentz force, V cross B, all I have to do is to align my straightened fingers in the direction of the first vector, V, and then bend them so that they line up with the second vector, B. Well, with my hand in this position, when I bend my fingers, they don't line up with the magnetic field at all. They end up pointing in the opposite direction. What I have to do is to turn my hand over, like this. Now, when I bend my fingers from the direction of V into the direction of B, they do indeed line up with the second vector. Note that in this position, my thumb, which shows the direction of the Lorentz force, is directed towards the, the axis of the helix. It's this centrally directed force that keeps the particle moving in its helical trajectory around the magnetic field. In a magnetic field of this kind, a so-called magnetic mirror, the Lorentz force acts in such a way that a moving particle is reflected by the region of strong field. As these iron filings reveal, a pair of coils can produce two magnetic mirrors facing one another. Such an arrangement is called a magnetic bottle. A single particle can be trapped in such a magnetic bottle by letting it bounce back and forth between the two magnetic mirrors. This suggests a simple way of trying to confine a plasma. If we take a column of plasma and apply a magnetic mirror at each end, it should be possible to trap the plasma and keep it reflecting back and forth between the two mirrors. But even this rather crude demonstration with low temperature plasma shows that the magnetic bottle doesn't work too well. The problem is that some plasma always gets out of the bottle. Particles that are moving mainly along the direction of the magnetic field can escape through the ends of the magnetic bottle. Even those particles which are not moving in that way may undergo collisions which help them to escape. Due to recent developments in the construction of magnetic mirrors, attempts are still being made to use linear magnetic fields combined with improved magnetic mirrors to contain hot plasma. However, another way around the problem of leaky ends is to construct a device that has no ends. For a number of years, attempts at plasma confinement have involved such toroidal or ring-shaped machines. This is just such a ring-shaped machine. The high-temperature plasma forms a continuous ring in a toroidal chamber about a meter beneath me here, so there are no leaky ends to worry about. Now, all of the complex equipment you can see around here isn't used to provide the magnetic field. Some of it is used to heat the plasma, and some of it is used to measure and observe what's happening to the plasma. But beneath all this complexity, the field coils aren't just a simple toroidal solenoid, because the field produced by such coils wouldn't confine a plasma. The problem with a simple toroidal solenoid is that its field is relatively strong at the inside, where the windings are close together, and relatively weak at the outside, where the windings are further apart. The non-uniformity of the magnetic field causes the plasma to drift across the magnetic field, towards the outer edge of the torus, instead of staying in one position. One way of preventing this kind of drifting is to take the simple circular pathway and turn it into a figure of eight. In a machine of this kind, a particle spiraling around a magnetic field would be like a car on a figure of eight racing track. The particle would spend part of its time 
in the strong field region, close to the inner edge of the machine, and part of its time in the weak field, near the outer edge. Over a complete circuit, there would be no tendency to drift across the field. The Americans tried to apply this principle in a strange-looking device called the stellarator. Another way of preventing the drifting across the magnetic field that occurs in a simple toroidal solenoid is not to twist the machine, but instead to twist the magnetic field. If we form a toroidal magnetic field and then give it a twist, the field lines form themselves into helices, passing from the inner to the outer edge of the machine. Once again, over a complete circuit, there is no tendency to drift across the magnetic field. That's just the approach that has been used on this stellarator, which looks almost as complicated from the side as it did from above. Here, the helical magnetic field is entirely produced by currents in external windings. And you can see some of these windings in here. They're the brown conductors on the surface of the torus. And they're helical, just like the field they help to produce. These helical windings were much easier to see before the machine was finally assembled. Here they are being tested, and the silver rings are used to clamp the field coils in position against the external forces. But complicated external windings aren't the only way of producing a helical magnetic field. Another way of producing this kind of helical field is by adding two other fields together. One like this, which can be produced by a toroidal solenoid, and one like this, a field that encircles the plasma. Because it's a good electrical conductor, the plasma itself can be used to produce this magnetic field. If a current is passed through the plasma in this direction, it will produce a magnetic field around itself in this direction. The desired helical field is the vector sum of these two contributions. This technique was used in one of the earliest British plasma physics experiments, zeta. A current of about half a million amps flowed through the plasma in zeta. In the mid-50s, Zeta made the headlines. Some people thought, wrongly as it turned out, that the plasma was hot enough for thermonuclear fusion to take place. However, such hopes were premature. One problem that dogged Zeta, and many other early attempts to confine plasma, was the so-called kink instability. Hot plasma in a magnetic field can behave very violently. It rapidly becomes unstable and develops kinks. Any attempt to confine plasma must overcome this problem. The Russians discovered that by strengthening one of the magnetic fields, they were able to prevent this kind of kinking, or at least delay its onset. The field that they strengthened was the one running through the plasma, this one. Devices which use this principle are called tokamaks, from the Russian words for toroidal magnetic chamber. Tokamaks now represent a major part of the world effort in the field of plasma confinement. Work is proceeding on large tokamaks in Japan, the USA, the USSR, and in Europe. This site is right next door to the Cullum Laboratory, and it's where the world's largest tokamak, the Joint European Taurus, or JET for short, is being built. The JET project is part of the fusion research program of the European Atomic Energy Community, plus Sweden and Switzerland. And the aim of this project is to produce a plasma at a high enough temperature and density, and to contain it for long enough for fusion to occur. The tokamak itself will sit in this massive concrete building over here, which has walls three meters thick. Before the concrete was actually cast, it was possible to look down from the air and see the site where the tokamak will sit. This is a scale model of the fully assembled tokamak. The toroidal vacuum chamber sits within the eight arms of a large transformer. The transformer is used to induce a current of three to five million amps in the plasma itself. That current, of course, will produce a magnetic field, and we can find its direction using the right hand method. With my thumb pointing in the direction of the current, my fingers tell me the direction of the magnetic field. 
it's in this direction. That's one component of the helical field. Another component of this field is a field around here in this direction. And that field is produced by a set of D-shaped coils that are outside the plasma. Over here, where they've been cut away, you can see that they're uniformly spaced around the torus. Here are four of those coils behind me, lying on their outside edge, waiting to be installed. Each of them is, in fact, made up of 24 turns of copper, and when they're operating, there'll be a current of 50,000 amps flowing through each turn. That current will produce a magnetic field of about three tesla in this direction, along the axis of the coil. If that's added to the circular field produced by the plasma current itself, then the vector sum is the helical field that's used to confine the plasma. Now, you can get some idea of the engineering problems involved in this project if I tell you that the mass of each of these coils is 12 tons. And when they're operating and have a current passing through them, then there's a magnetic force towards the center that's in this direction, equal in magnitude to the weight of a 2,000 ton object. The 20 years of research between Zeta and Jet have led to a much better understanding of the complex interactions between plasmas and magnetic fields. So it may well be that before long, a tokamak light jet will be successful in producing controlled thermonuclear fusion. If so, our understanding of magnetic fields and their influence on plasmas will have played a major role in enabling us to harness the energy source of the sun.